name is Kalab Joel and in this video we are going to look at whether mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable. So the fundamental concepts of mathematics that were disturbing the mathematical community when mathematics was first was developing. One of them was deciding whether mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable quite an iron there so what some of those questions the first one was that is mathematics consistent or it is not consistent another one was that is mathematics com mathematics complete or it is not complete and the one which you are dealing with now is that is mathematics cons uh, uh, decidable or it is not decidable so in this video we are going to look at whether mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable. So on the concept of whether mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable, we are going to first look at or consider the concept of set theory. And then thereby after that we will look at some few examples whereby will be it will be illustrated that on whether mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable. So before we proceed, I would like to say that this video was supported by Amazon Audible, more of Amazon Audible at the end of the video. So on set theory, so according to mathematics, a set is a world as a collection of well-defined objects, and these objects, the set is included in these objects. So a set is a collection of well-defined objects with a set being included. As one of the objects so this improving whereby mathematics is desirable or it is not desirable using set theory will first consider an, an example of a set a set which contains all the sets so a set which contains all set, all the sets we will now decide we will try to decide whether this set con actually contains all the sets so I hope it's clear there so what we are going to do is that we are going to consider if this set contains all the sets it means that it contains all the sets including itself so and if it contains if it needs to contain all the sets including itself for it to become uh, the sets of all the sets it will cease to become the sets of all the sets because it is requiring itself to be part of a part to, to, it is requiring itself as one of the objects that are composed of it so and before the objects that are composed of it we didn't know since since this set is one of the objects that contains that is contains in itself we cannot know whereby uh, we, we cannot decide that it is complete since we are trying to show that it is complete by including it as one of the objects that form it i don't know if you are getting so the main picture here is that if it is if, if, if it contains all the sets all, all, all the sets it does not contain all the sets if it does not contain all the sets then it contains all the sets we are driven to the point of contradiction so by being contradicted we have actually proven that uh, mathematics is undecidable that's what that's what you call proof by contradiction so i know that might be a little confusing let us consider examples which are more relevant to us to our day-to-day -day life the first example is that let us consider there are students in class who can perform all the sums, all the questions that cannot be performed by other students. This might work well on all other students except the, the student himself or herself. But when we consider the student himself or herself not being able to perform a sum, how what will be the condition of our statement if you really think 
you will consider you, you will realize that we will come into a point of contradiction side that we will be the statement will be like if this student can do all the tasks that the other students cannot do then he cannot do and if this student cannot do all the tasks that all the other students cannot do bearing in mind that all these students he has this student who is performing this task to be included so if he can't do all those sums then he can't if he can't then he can we are contradicting ourselves so it further proves the point that mathematics is undecidable maybe another example let's say there's a barber in a certain village and this barber can only shave those people who cannot shave themselves in that village bearing in mind that this barber is included since the barber lives in the village so it works well for all other people but when we come and consider the barber himself or herself then we are contradicted because if, if, if the barber can shave himself or herself then he can't and if he can't then he can a point of contradiction so on all those example examples we have proven that mathematics is undecidable so this contrary to our normal thinking because we usually think that we we are decidable we have that capability to decide so that is not true because we have shown that mathematically speaking we are undecidable this is not just in mathematics it also appears in all uh, those other sciences for example in physics the concept of undecidability is very prominent especially in quantum mechanics so also it brings into light that even our thinking we are undecidable since because mathematics is the basis of all computing and actually our minds we are computing so it means that we are all undecidable we, 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 we are we cannot decide since mathematics is undecidable all the computation there is a point in computation whereby we cannot decide uh, we are undecided and it's not because of lack of information it's just the fundamental truth of nature i think that was that's clear that was that's the end of this video so as i had said earlier this video was supported by amazon audible Amazon Audible is this collection of books, different types of books, both in the field of mathematics, sciences, engineering, even novels. And instead of reading them, you can have someone read out for you and you will be listening to them in form of podcasts. So to get to sign up for Amazon Audible is very free. So you can sign up for free using the link on the video or you can get the link down in the description i want to thank amazon for supporting this video and i want to thank you for listening or for watching thank you this episode is brought to you by cisco educational premium in 1494 luca pacioli publishes summa de arithmetica a comprehensive collection of all known mathematics in Renaissance Italy. In it, there is a section on the cubic equation. By this time, people have been trying to deduce the general solution of the cubic equation for at least 4,000 years. Each civilization that faced it would not conquer it, the cubic equation. So, reasonably, Pacioli's conclusion is that the solution to the cubic equation is simply impossible. Back in those days, mathematics was not written down in equations. It was wordy and at times poetic. People viewed mathematics literally. 
all mathematical concepts were drawn from the real world and anything that could not adapt was met with a lot of skepticism. Geometry was much loved as it described things that could be seen. Imagine you stepped in ancient Italy in the Renaissance period. You are a student attending some math class. You step on the door then proceed to sit on that favorite chair and table of yours right by the corner. It is at that day of those cuts again and you have a mathematics test. The first question you have been told to solve the quadratic equation. x squared plus 4x is equivalent to 12. Opposite to how you will complete the square algebraically, you will actually complete a literal square to solve the equation. You will be having some sort of manila paper. To solve the quadratic equation, you will cut a literal square with side x from your manila paper to represent the x square part of the equation. After this, you will cut a rectangle of side x for the width and side 4 for the length. I will still remember that the equation equals 12. To solve this quadratic equation, you would cut your rectangle into two parts, each with width x and side 2. You would then reorganize these two rectangles with that first square, put side x to form a bigger square with side 2x. This square is not complete. To complete it, you would need to add a square of side 2, which is missing in the middle. Then because you have added two square on one side of the equation, you will also add another two square on the other side to get 16. So we have the big square being equal to 16. Then finding the square root of 16, you will find it to be 4, which will represent the side of the big square. As you can see, you can derive the value of x to be 2, because 2x is equivalent to 4. And so you would have solved the quadratic equation. Looks like you have a bright future in math. You have found the solution to be 2, right? But so is negative 6. You see, back in those days, you wouldn't consider negative 6 to be a solution because negative 6 will not be geometrically relevant. After all, how would you have a negative area? It doesn't make sense. In fact, contrary to these days where we have the quadratic formula x is equivalent to negative b plus or minus root b square minus 4ac on 2a to be the general solution to the quadratic equation. In those days, there was no general solution to the quadratic equation because those ancient ones had not accepted the idea of negative solution, especially the square root of a negative number. The same approach was taken for the Gibbic equation with a search for a general solution bearing no fruit. No wonder Omar Kayam wrote, maybe one of those who will come after us will succeed in finding it. Now comes another character in our story, Scipione del Ferro. Scipione del Ferro is a mathematics professor at the University of Bologna. Around the year 1508 to 1512, he finds a method to solve depressed cubics. What are depressed cubics? Depressed cubics are a category of cubic equations with no x square term. So what does it do after solving a problem that have obsessed mathematicians for thousands of years? One considered to be impossible by Leonardo da Vinci's math teacher? He tells nobody. You see, being a full-time mathematician is hard. If you don't find an opportunity in teaching, you would need to be publishing papers frequently to leave off patterns. In the 16th century, it was even harder. Your job would be constantly under threat from other mathematicians who can show up at any time and challenge you for your position. There was no particular formal certification or job guarantee. It was all decided on a duel. A math duel, if you are feeling fancy. So how is this math duel done? You can think of it like those math contests you had in high school. If you were 
fortunate enough to attend or are fortunate enough to attend but more like chess it's a one on one game except it's not a game this time your job your source of livelihood is at stake each participant submits a set of questions to the other and the person who solves the most questions correctly gets the job while the other doesn't and more suffers public humiliation so far as delfero knows he is the smartest mathematician alive so he guarantees his job security because no one else can solve the depressed cubics for nearly 20 years he keeps this secret but as with human life we are not immortal Scipion is now a very old man in 1526 about to pass on before he passes he breaks the secret to his supposed favorite student Antonio Fior our third character in our story unlike Del Ferro Fior is not the smartest mathematician alive nor is he the second or even the third he's just a regular mathematician like you and I okay maybe only like me but Fior is very ambitious one of those guys who will build castles in their imaginations after Del Ferro's death he boasts about his mathematical ingenuity and even has the audacity to dare to be able to solve the depressed cubic equations remember that type of cubic equations about this time Niccolo Fontana Totalia another mathematician our fourth character moves to Fiore's town of Venice and just so he knows who is who in the town at least in math Fiore plans to challenge this new mathematician Totalia in math duel remember the math duel on february 12 1535 fior challenges nicolo totalia on a math duel totalia is a dyad as a kid he survived an attack by a french soldier who left his face open by a cut that's why he is named totalia which translates as tatra in italian grown up in poverty Totalia is largely self-taught, one of those self-made guys. He closed up his way to the Italian society to become a renowned mathematician. Now all of this is at stake. As in the math duel, questions are exchanged to see who wins. The visitor Nicolo Totalia decides to take the lead. He gives Antonio Fiore 30 math questions, while Fiore on the other hand gives totalia 30 questions all of which are depressed cubics each mathematician has about a month for the days to solve the equations they have been given now here is the challenge who will win and who will lose oh my my a big surprise is that nicolo totalia our hidden dyad solves all of your questions in just two hours while Antonio Fior continues to attempt Totalia's questions. What's the hurry? There is like four days. Right, everybody? Cisco Educational Premium is a section of Cisco Educationals with content that is not hosted here. There are episodes ranging from long to short videos. Remember those good old shots of ours? They are there. So do we get there? Use the link on screen or in the description or in the pinned comment below. Enjoy yourself. Now we'll see you in the next episode of Cisco Educationals. Yeah.